from Microbe TV. This is Twivo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 48, recorded on October 24th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Salt Lake City, Utah, Nels Eldi. Hey, Vincent, and hello, everyone, from LD Lab Studios. Forgot to say that you are listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Yeah, I thought that kind of jumped in quickly there. I was sort of startled for a second. Yeah, you but, change uh, things and people get <laughs> startled, right? How have you been? Well... Doing great, and uh, wanted to wish a happy fourth anniversary to Twivo. We're episode 48 here, divide by 12, and we're at four years. Amazing. It's amazing. F- wow. F- time really goes yeah. by. 48 episodes. Yeah. It's, yeah, I like uh, Twivo's a lot of fun, you and I, and sometimes guests. I agree. I'm having a blast, and I was um, nicely surprised walking into my office um, a little earlier today. Diane Downauer, who's the lab manager mm-hmm. of the LD Lab, got a Twivo fourth anniversary cake, nice. put it on my desk. So Looks good. All, uh, Looks good. Yeah. We didn't, I'm sorry to say, Vincent, we didn't save you a piece. Yeah, it's all so. gone. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a photo of it that we can share. So uh, with, Diane uh, is our, aware with, of Twivo? She is, yeah. So it's the LD Lab, I think sometimes they just want to make sure, you know, I'm still around and kind of part of the <laughs> conversation. So they'll listen in <laughs> to our podcasts and make sure I'm still ticking um so yeah i know we have we have some great local listeners and supporters including i'm happy to say from my own crew here and so no, it's kind of touching to get that cake and to nice, very good. have that support it's one of, i think it's one of the really fun things we do running labs is um associate with really great people who are friendly kind supportive and also incredible scientists doing interesting things so it's um, an honor and a privilege to be part of that and to continue through with Twivo. Well, I have to say is they should mail me a uh, a cake, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what I can do, Vincent. I'll That's see what okay. I can do. <laughs> we have a great paper today. Yeah, we do. So we're um, uh, back to a topic or a critter that we've considered before. So the, the name of the paper is Light Regulated Collective Contractility you know, multicellular coanoflagellate. And um, the coanoflagellates are not foreign to Twivo. So if we turn back to our first year, near the end of our first year of podcasting, we had Nicole King from Berkeley on as a guest in an episode entitled Microbial Accomplices in Multicellularity, uh, yeah. Twivo 11. Wow, do long time yeah, ago. <laughs> yeah, do you remember that yeah, conversation? I do, yeah. We, we had her over Skype from uh, Berkeley, yeah. Yeah, it was great. And so she was telling us um, better than certainly I can do it, um, why she picked the coanoflagellate. So these are these um, protozoans. They're sort of one of the nearest cousins, evolutionarily speaking, to animals. They're not animals, but um, our last common ancestors um, between animals and coanos was um, relatively close compared to other species, things like, or other lineages, things like fungi algae, other things like that. And so um, Nicole and a few others have been pioneers of um, picking this up as a model system or a research organism and really developing it to ask um, some incisive questions about the origins of multicellularity by having this uh, really cool kind of comparison point to the family tree so, of, of animals, so to speak. Hmm. So um, maybe backtracking to this specific paper. So first, I just wanted to highlight, call out the authors, um, Thibaut Brunet, Ben Larson, Tess Linden, Mark Vermage, uh, Kent McDonald, and uh, Nicole King, uh, coming out of Berkeley. And uh, three first authors on this one, um, Thibaut, Ben, and Tess. Uh, and so just even from the title, some really interesting observations and uh, uh, a newly discovered coanoflagellate species that is light regulated and undergoes this uh, so-called collective contractility. So we'll, we'll dig in on that in a few moments. But so if you 
are interested or this sounds intriguing, just thinking about the quantiflagellates and this idea of, of picking how you might think kind of evolutionarily of picking an organism like this to study, I would uh, first of all direct our listeners to Twevo 11 if you really want a kind of a deeper dive um, from Nicole herself, who um, does a lot more justice uh, to, to this than I, than I certainly can. Um, one of the points that we've raised on Twevo and I want to kind of put out at the beginning is uh, this notion of even though, you know, so these critters that you can find in aquatic environments, they um, live and feed on bacteria and can go from single cell forms to multicellular forms. And there's some kind of important formal definitions in that. Um, but so this is being used as a comparison point to investigate the origins of multicellularity, but that's not to say that they're, they themselves are primitive in any way. They're just as modern of species as we are. Uh, they've just diverged from sort of a common ancestor at, at a really intriguing sort of point in biological history um, to, to make the comparison. So not a living fossil, so to speak, that terminology that you sometimes hear that can, I think can be a little bit misleading, um, but instead a really good comparison point. Yeah, they've decided not to progress, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, they- <laughs> they're, they're, they're contemporary, but yeah, yeah. You know, their, their evolution didn't proceed. Well, maybe others proceeded, and they, they're quite happy in their niche, and they take advantage of that, right? Well, sort of. So I would make the case that they have progressed just in a different way than mm -hmm. we have. And so, you know, so certainly they've been, those populations have been exposed to as much time, environment, sort of sources of mutation, et cetera. And um, you're right. I agree with you, Vince. So they are sort of um, perhaps there's some echoes or some uh, uh, sort of reminiscent of more ancient forms when we think about how our direct um, ancestors, some, some of the, um, you know, um, complexity or sort of cellular features or th things like that, that, that our species step through, but it's, yeah, that's, a, that's again, the sort of gets into this uh, complicated idea of a living fossil. It's sort of progression has happened, even though it resembles sort of a more ancient form. Mm. And so I think the comparison is, and as we'll hear about today, I think is really compelling and fascinating, but um, the evolution has just happened in, you know, the, the notion of complexity. So um, and, and our perspective of it, I think is important to um, sort of consider. So whereas, um, you know, any coin of flagellate would probably be a terrible podcast host. Um, we would probably be really terrible in a tide pool trying to survive off bacteria. And so in that sense, these guys have really taken advantage of all of that time and kind of natural selection, so to speak, to get to where they are in the environments they live in. Whereas um, our species kind of went a different direction. And now we do all of these really strange behaviors like um, talk to each other over Skype calls and stuff like that. Um, so it's it's kind of a different form of complexity, maybe is one way of thinking about it. Yeah, I didn't mean to imply that they, they hadn't progressed, but. They stayed in that little niche, yeah. And yep. the way they are is completely appropriate for that niche. Oh, absolutely! Right? Yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Which is but the same for many other things uh, that that are on Earth in certain niches. And you know, they're not human. Not everything has to be a human, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, exactly. So um, up until now, um, and on Twivo Eleven, we were talking about this species. S. Rosetta. And one of the reasons it's been such a great kind of research organism is that it's sort of revealed some of these secrets of some of the transitions into multicellularity, at least from a comparative standpoint. And so now the King Lab, and I don't know all the details or the backstory of this, but they've been out in the field. Um, they've been doing some um, quantiflagellate collecting Mm -hmm. And in, in a, a pretty tough place, right? <laughs> That's right. So we're, they've been in the Caribbean islands uh, on the island of Caraco. Have you ever been? Curacao. Or, or, Curacao. Oh, my God. I'm way off on that one. <laughs> Curious. Excuse I've me. I've been there, yeah. yes. You have? Many, many years ago when I was very okay. young. Oh, wow. I didn't see any coanoflagellates, though. No? You weren't on the lookout? No, unfortunately not. But this yeah. just is amazing because it goes to show that there's more to find out there. <laughs> right? well, that's for sure, right? Yeah. These are microscopic, so, you know, I don't um beat yourself up too much for missing them when you were there. But was that for uh work or vacation or 
I don't. Visited? It's it's definitely not Curious work stuff. because this is. I was so young. I wasn't working. Mm. I don't remember gotcha. what what the what brought me there. Might have it was probably parental stuff, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that is my parents bringing me. Right, I didn't go on my own. Yeah, cool. Might have been on some. I don't know. It's but I've been there because I know how to say it. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> certainly, I probably wouldn't know. <laughs> certainly better than me. Uh, closest I've been, I think, is to in that neck of the woods is um, Puerto Rico. Mm-hmm. On the island of uh, Vieques, but that's uh, it's still yeah. This the Curacao is on the off the kind of northern coast of South America, right? Exactly. Yep. Um, and so they were there collecting from tide pools and found. And, we, um, and it's too bad we don't have Nicola, because she could tell us why they were there. But oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So the one clue, actually, if you look at the acknowledgments, um, they acknowledge this. Um, grant organization in the Canadian Advanced Research. We're going north instead of south for a moment. But I think um, Nicole and a few others um, who've been sort of in the Twivo uh, um, podcasts over the years now um, have been part of this big grant uh, on symbioses between organisms, if I'm remembering right. And so I think some of the funding at least came from that. Mm. There's also um, some acknowledgments of the physiology course at Woods Hole. So but we're um, scientists like Nicole and others are out collecting in the wild and then bringing some of the specimens for analysis to the um, physiology course. And so this might have been folded into that in some way, shape, or form as well. Mm. Mm. Um, regardless of that, I think this idea of scientists getting outside and just collecting stuff, I love that as a part of the menu. For, for doing modern science. Yeah, we've had so. quite a few here on Twivo, right? Mm-hmm, exactly. I did a TWIM last week at Georgia Tech, mm-hmm. and one of our guests uh, samples corals in Fiji. Wow, very cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll be out next week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so this, and now she's a postdoc um, looking at seagrass and still sampling, you know? So yeah, I guess once great. you get that in you, you like to just keep doing it. Yeah, and kind of a great return to, I think, you know, more historic um, science approaches. We kind of got, you know, deep into the laboratory in the last generation or two as molecular biology really um, sort of dominated the field. And what's really fun and some of the stuff that we continue to lift up for Tuivo is seeing how people are returning to the complexity out there and sort of ecological settings. And then, um, and as we'll see today, sort of bringing some of this diversity back to the laboratory with all of the new tools available to start to gain kind of new looks at things or new insights about how in yeah. this case will be, yeah, the evolution of multicellularity as it relates to um, contractility of these cell- cellular sheets. Yeah, it's cool. We don't have to just look and describe. We can do experiments and get really deep. Yeah. Inside yep. these organisms, right? Yeah, agreed. So the thing that caught their eye when they got pulled this guy or they're sampling the tide pools was that, um, sort of, first of all, I think it looked very much like coenoflagellates, which they're sort of on the prowl for to begin with. Um, but then almost immediately they saw this really interesting um, cellular behavior that was um, somewhat unusual. I don't know if they were specifically looking for that or how kind of serendipitous it was that they – Saw this, but what they noted um, pretty quickly was that the um, array, the sheet of cells, or the array, the colony of coenoflagellates, the multicellular form, would actually contract pretty dramatically um, and almost reverse its polarity as a, a cellular sheet. And those kind of behaviors are um, somewhat reminiscent um, to animal cell movements and morphological processes. And so I think that was sort of the exciting. Um, first insight here was that they might have almost a new model system or experimentally tractable system to make these kind of comparisons back through evolutionary time. This, they look cool. They're mm-hmm. so it's it's a a bunch of cells, hundreds mm-hmm. of cells, right? They're flagellated. Yeah, and these each cell has a collar, which is a characteristic mm-hmm. uh, of microvilli. And so on each cell, the collar surrounds the flagellum. And this whole thing of a few hundred cells is contracting. In particular, it's inverting, right? Yeah, it's cur- agreed. Curving in one way or the other. And they said it was doing this <laughs> back and forth. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> 
Yeah. And I think the thing that kind of tipped them off that it wasn't sort of quantum flagellates as usual was that the, was the arrangement of the flagella when they were looking at it, where they were all kind of pushed to the middle. And mm-hmm. for some of the more well-studied forms, it's the reverse orientation where the flagella are out instead of inward. Right. right. Yep. So inverted, the flagella are out, and then flagella in is relaxed. Right. That's right. right. Yep. And so here are the flagella when they saw it, we're pointing, quote unquote, the wrong direction, in a sense. And that's actually morphologically, I think that's closer to what you see in some animals, like the sponges um, <clears throat> that form these sort of chambers that are, um, as they're filtering bacteria and other potential prey from seawater, um, they have that more um, sort of uh, inverted or um, flagella in morphology. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit. Mm-hmm. By the way, I heard a talk by Julie Pfeiffer, um, Mm. Last year at the double stranded RNA meeting in Belgium, she was the keynote speaker. Mm. Very cool. And she had run into Nicole King somewhere, I don't know, and thought, yeah. let let me look for viruses of coanoflagellates, mm-hmm. <laughs> which I, we, I'm sure we mentioned on episode that's right. 11 because that's my main question usually. <laughs> <laughs> that's so, right. And actually, yep. so, and I know a, a little for, bit of that backstory, just to, sorry to. Yeah, interrupt. Yeah. But yep. Yeah, so um, there is a former grad student from Nicole's lab, and a uh, paper. One of the papers we were that, discussing yeah. exactly, and so sort of formed a direct intellectual bridge yeah, yeah, between right. Nicole and Julie's lab. And in fact, they just I saw were awarded a Pew Innovation Fund grant um, to start to pursue that um, through. Um, I think it's Ariel is the name of the um, postdoc, and she's going to be uh, spearheading some of those efforts. Mm. I think they went to a stream right next to the building and they found some in there so they can have a continuous supply. Yeah, very cool. You can and, find these things all over the place. Right. Mm-hmm. Even in New York, probably. Oh, yeah, of course. Yep. So yep. the question is, why do you need to go to Curacao? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that we can't answer because we don't have the insight, but uh, I'm sure there was a reason. Well, and figure one panel B out on this sort of you know, majestic coast of uh, Caribbean Island might sort of explain part of the motivation. That looks like a <laughs> <laughs> right. pretty inspiring place to do science. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they were interested in understanding what's going on here, right? Basic curiosity. That's right. And, and, and as you said, it's got some, the reasons to want to study contractility in such an ancient organism, right? Yeah, exactly. It's kind of a cool cellular trick, which is that can invert that entire cellular sheet to the flagella from the flagella into the flagella, flagella out form in about 30 seconds of time. So here we have an organism that can exist as a single cell and multicellular form. So can give you hints about the, the origin of multicellularity. Mm-hmm. And then beyond that, the multicellular forms for at least for this new species they found can contract yeah. So it's kind of along the line of where we think things moved. And so let's study it, right? Totally agree. And kind of layering this cool kind of biological complexity onto a system that already has sort of been really useful to consider some of the origins of, of some of this uh, biology. Mm-hmm. But they weren't out of the woods yet. So just because you find something in a tide pool doesn't mean that you can necessarily study it in the lab. And so um, kind of an interesting description in the study of the process of lab domestication, or at least it's hinted at. Um, I'm kind of fascinated by this because, you know, there's a reason that budding yeast, that fruit flies, Drosophila, that the nematodes, C. elegans, have been so successful as uh, research organisms. E. coli. E. coli, exactly, and and you know the handful of others. If it were they're, they're, they were domesticated successfully or had the features that made that possible. And so as a geneticist, I think it's, you know, that, that notion of um, how the ease of lab domestication is not a trivial matter at all. Um, although it's sort of, in some ways, the technical details of how you might do that, that's sort of make or break for whether the prospects of actually studying these things or, 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 or building a community that can study these things really depends on the ability to domesticate them. And so um, in this case, uh, you know, so these things need bacteria. So as you, one of the things you'd want to do, as, especially with something that's microbial, is to try to get it basically, you know, away from potentially contaminating species or other critters that could outgrow the thing that you're interested in studying, right? If you're constantly battling 
trying to study something against something else that's dividing faster, that can become um, a, a, a really massive obstacle. And then in this case, you have to balance it against the fact that these are predators. They feed, the quinoflagellates feed on bacteria. They need bacteria. And so how do you balance those two things? It can really be an art uh, uh, to successfully bring these uh, animal or these um, cells like this into the into the laboratory, and so they actually note that there was another species of quinoflagellates. I think instead of called flexa, it was called perplexa <laughs> that <laughs> that might have had similar <coughs> excuse me um, behaviors. Yeah, but that after they brought it into the lab, it stopped exhibiting. Mm the sort of cellular contractions that is exactly what they wanted to study. Maybe so that's why they named it perplexa. <laughs> that's right. I don't know the, the history of that one, but, but, and that could happen here, right? So um, obviously it's only been a short amount of time since they made this discovery as they're just reporting it now. Um, but will this, um, will flexa, the quinoflagellate that they named, will it continue to carry out these behaviors or do you have to go back to the wild and sort of continuously collect it? That could actually speak to the future prospects of really um, establishing or, or using this organism for work into the future. Mm -hmm. And so I think stay tuned to see how, how it does. Yeah. But it's been, I think, you know, it's a pretty rare that um, a, a wild organism graduates as a lab organism mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because, and, and, the, and when they do, there are certainly kind of biological compromises that happen. So I think we would acknowledge that E. coli, uh, the lab strains are pretty different than a lot of the wild ones. Same with budding yeast. Um, and so the biology can change pretty drastically. Inbred mice are another example. So anyway, I think it's an important um, point to keep in mind some of the challenges. It it's, can sound kind of fun and romantic to go and collect these things, to then establish them as sort of uh, – uh, a strong research organism in a laboratory is a whole nother sort of level of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So they had to uh, manually pick out these, these collections of cells away from everything else in the water and Correct. then put it back into seawater with bacteria that these coanos typically need. <laughs> exactly. So they would grow, right? <laughs> That's right. And so there you're kind of balancing the sort of, you know, food with, the food's alive and wants to um, divide and go crazy as well. Mm. And so, yeah, that, that can be a, um, a challenging balancing act. But apparently it worked. So they're able to throw them in. The, all the experiments we're going to talk about ba is based on yeah. this. Agree. So, so far, so good. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, other, you know, not trivial point here is to confirm that this is a quinoflagellate. So certainly by the morphology, both the single cell and the sheets, it looks pretty good. Mm. Um, but they note that they used 18S ribosomal sequencing um, to then compare it to known quinoflagellate species. And that allowed them to um, actually kind of pinpoint where it sits on the phylogenetic tree among the other quinoflagellates that have been described. And so they have a nice um, sort of summary figure of that in the first figure. Uh, it shows both the difference in the um, flagella in and flagella out forms, that sort mm -hmm. of massive contractile, that's sort of a diagram of that. And then also a tree showing where this new uh, coanoneca flexa, of, as they've named it, where it sits in the sits next to the other known quinoflagellates and its closest relative is that perplexa species that they know that lost that behavior when it was domesticated. So Coanoeca flexa. Coanoeca flexa. Thank you. Yeah. My, my pronunciation is I'm now O for two. That's um, nice that they can name it because in, in virology, if you want to name a virus, you have to get it approved mm, mm -hmm. by the ICTV. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, if they don't like your name, they won't accept it. Yeah, I've heard some kind of horror stories along those lines. And yep, that can be a tricky, the taxonomists can be a tricky crew. So I guess here you can just name it, right? I think so, yeah. Um, certainly, you can certainly propose a name. And um, I think they're, you know, it's a again, a balancing act. So they're putting it based on the um, biological relatedness. Like, so to give it, so to put it in the same genus. Mm -hmm. Um. And so that's, you know, you're using sort of the historical names of the most closely related guys. And that's, you definitely want, I think that's a balancing act, right? To, yeah, for sure. um, to make sure that you're not making life even more complicated. But, um, so yeah, it's an interesting part of the process and, and kind of a fun part of the process, right? When you're discovering new species oh, to actually, yeah. Yeah. to actually be able to name them, kind of add your, um, stamp 
um, to it. So let me describe this because you're listening to this podcast. So this is a, a circular sheet of cells, right? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of cells. Mm -hmm. And there's a relaxed form where the flagella are facing. The, the sheet is kind of slightly curved. Yeah. And it's extended and the flagella are facing in. And then the inverted form, it goes the other way. It contracts to a, a, a circle of smaller circumference. It doesn't close. Uh, there's an opening at one end. And now the flagella are out. Right? Yeah. That's exactly right. Relaxed flagella in, inverted flagella out. Now, if you're thinking the inverted would make it easy to swim, you're probably correct. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Because, <laughs> exactly. yeah, they're outside and they're obviously going to make this thing move around, right? Because that's where they are. That's right. And, in, and just as you're pointing out, because it's not a closed structure, there's some polarity sort of built into that. And so mm. um, depending on how the flagella beat, there can be some... Um, the ability to move right. productively. Yeah, and so they describe it as a multicellular cup-shaped colony. And I think that holds mm -hmm. for, for probably both of those forms. Mm -hmm. And then we'll we'll get into maybe some of the kind of ecological behavior, the outcome of the relaxed versus the inverted form, where in one case, as we're hinting at, you can swim really well, and then they make the case and show some evidence that in the relaxed form yeah. that you can eat well. And so that will come into the story. Um, pretty soon as well. And so um, the first thing though was, is actually the um, almost literally the light switch here. So what causes um, <clears throat> the sheet of cells to invert or not to, f to kind of flip back and forth between these two pretty drastically different morphologies. And so it sounded like at least the way they told the story that that was sort of, again, sort of serendipitous. So of course they're looking at these colonies under the microscope and a light microscope, which means you're casting a ton of light on them. And they noticed that sort of spontaneous flipping that they observed started to stop the more, the longer it was under the microscope. Um, however, when they turned off the microscope and it got dark, all of a sudden you're back to that light flipping again. And so that was the clue that there might be some light sensitivity um, going on here in this, the light, regulated part mm -hmm. of this um, contractility like behavior. Right. Yeah. And so from there, you know, and this is kind of an interesting, I think sub theme um, of the paper as well, or kind of backstory here is how, um, you know, when you're studying something that you're just observing for the first time in a new species or newly discovered species is how you kind of borrow from what's known in this case, like an animal systems and, or other systems so how do um, how do cells respond to light? And one of the major molecular tools for doing this is rhodopsin. And so um, this light sensitive uh, receptor. <clears throat> and so this is something you know kind of harkens back probably to high school biology, at least for me, when I first learned about rhodopsin. And um, and so they very quickly you know that was sort of a first working hypothesis. Could it be? that there is a rhodopsin or a rhodopsin like protein in the, in the genome of these coenoflagellates. There were some known in other coenoflagellates so that helped to sort of narrow in on that idea. And so to look and see whether there could be a rhodopsin, that's a light sensitive receptor that then could somehow be part of this um, signaling process. They sequenced the transcriptome of the new species um, flexa and found uh, four rhodopsin, uh, like receptors that were hooked to or fused with another protein of uh, phosphodiesterase. So the rho PDE for short for rhodopsin pho phosphodiesterase um, could immediately hint at both a, a receptor for light and then a signal that's transduced into the activity of a phosphodiesterase. And these are enzymes that will um, modify cyclic nucleotides. So cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP, some of the other um, nucleotides that are commonly used as uh, to transduce signals uh, in cells, so-called secondary messengers. So the cyclic is the bond is going to be cut by the phosphodiesterase, right? That's right. Or you modify from um, two different cyclic forms. I'm trying to remember the specific... Um, 
uh, or sorry, yeah, you're right. So you are just cleaving from the cyclic yeah. form to a non-cyclic form. Right. That's that's, exactly what, that's right. what a esterase yep. would do. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> exactly. Right, and then that's the right. idea being that the rhodopsin is absorbing light, and then somehow that is transferred to activate the phosphodiesterase, which then makes this cleaves this cyclic nucleotide, and then the product is uh, active in some way. Exactly right. 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 And there's another kind of key feature here that's important um, for the experiments they do, which is that there's a cofactor for rhodopsin called retinol. And this, again, kind of sounds familiar. Retina, retinol, this is this is happening in our biology as we sense light um, through our eyes. And so <clears throat> because of what is already known about how rhodopsin works and how retinol is sort of a key cofactor, that allowed them to work really quickly to sort of test the idea that there could be one of those four potentially rhodopsin um, phosphodiesterase proteins could be involved in this light sensing that then gets transduced into a signal to somehow cause the uh, flip in polarity from the or the inversion of this that whole cellular sheet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So a couple of experiments, and remember, this is a newly isolated species, and so like genetic modifications, which I'm sure they're working on, um, only recently have come online for some of the more well-studied species. So that might be a work in progress, but they were able to, they made actually one what looks like a useful inference, which is that you don't have in this, um, in the genome or at the transcriptome of this species, it lacks a retinol synthesis pathway. And so the implication is that it has to get retinol from another source and actually mm-hmm. bacteria make retinol. And so it could just be the prey are the source of the cofactor that they would need to do this biology. Mm -hmm. And so to test that, they decided to take away the bacteria that they had sort of in the cultures that they established and replace it with a strain of pseudomonas bacteria that also lacks the ability to make retinol. And then they just allow them to feed and go for a while. And what they observe is that the coanoflagellates stop inverting. Um, Mm -hmm. when, when they were exposed to dark. So that was the, you know, the flipping the light switch off to cause the inversion, Mm -hmm. that ability went away with the lack of a prey bacteria, um, or the the, uh, prey bacteria that lacked the retinol. Very clever. Very Very clever. Yep. And then I agree. Yeah. Kind of fun. And then in some important rescue experiments. So, cause you want to know the specificity here, right? So, couple things they did. One was to co-culture then with not just the bacteria that lacked retinol, but then add in ones that do produce it. And all of a sudden the behavior came back. Mm -hmm. Um, Or if they kind of cut to the chase and add retinol alone to the culture medium, that flipping behavior also was restored after it was lost. So that's a nice way to start zooming in on it. They also do some complementary experiments uh, on the phosphodiesterase side. So you can inhibit that activity um, with some chemical inhibitors, actually caffeine. This works. next time you drink coffee, man, you realize you're inhibiting your <laughs> phosphodiesterases. That's right. Buyer beware. <laughs> Maybe that's what wakes you up. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so they did two or three different treatments like that that could actually, in this case, would stimulate the inversion. And so the idea is that if you block the phosphodiesterase, then mm. you keep the cyclic form of the nucleotide, which is what's doing that signal. If you allow the phosphodiesterase to clip it into the non-cyclical form, then it turns off that signal and the um, uh, inversion uh, doesn't happen. You don't get inversion. So you need the cyclic form to get the inversion, right? You need the cyclic form to get the inversion. And they can add those. They can add cyclic GMP and show that it causes inversion under conditions where you've inhibited the that's what they're esterase, right? Mm-hmm. That's right. I might have actually said it backwards. So you add those inhibitors, you don't make, or you, you keep the cyclic form, which keeps things active. Yep. 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 All right. So that, you know, at least they got, a, I think, a really nice start on pinpointing. So, so now is this like coanos on caffeine? Is that <laughs> That's right. Coanos on caffeine are going to, uh, are they're, yeah, they're all nervous and jittery. They'll start inverting like crazy. That's right. Maybe that right. could. You, you know what they say that's cool here? <laughs> That we'd like to prove this, but we'd have to disrupt all four rhodopsin yeah. genes. That's which right. I guess they were going to work on, right? Oh, yeah. And that gets into the ability to sort of do genetic manipulations. Yeah. Um, that might work into our title somehow, Coanos on Caffeine. I do like it. It kind of sounds good, right? Because yeah. it's a little, 
you know, it's a big assembly of Coanos and it's doing something that mm-hmm. the others didn't do. They, they're contracting, right? Yeah, they're kind of getting jittery. Well, we'll have to put that through the complicated Twivo title process, naming process and see where we come out. At the yeah, end. it's a very complex algorithm, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's right. Very mysterious, even after four years of podcasting. <laughs> I think okay. the, the names have evolved. They used to be more straightforward, and then we got silly, I think. Well, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the trick is to be both silly but kind of informative, right? That's the best case scenario. Now, someone wrote in on Twiv saying that the titles are useless. He can't find anything he wants. Mm. So I my my feeling is, well, we can't cover it all in one title, so yeah, you might as well not cover any of it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that's right. Or keep striving. We're still still adapting to yeah. the yeah, ideal sort of title optima, but easier said than done, actually. All right. So already, you know, I think they've made, you know, some really nice strides from kind of all the way from the tide pool to sort of narrowing in potentially on, you know, candidate um receptors for this pretty cool cellular behavior. So basically um, the inversion depends on light, right? Exactly. And a cyclic second messenger, which is pretty cool. Yeah, agreed. So then that starts to raise, okay, well, why are they doing this? What is the use of mm-hmm. the um, flipping behavior? Yeah, maybe what is the use is a better way to put it. If you say why, we can never answer a why question. Cor- I agree. So, <laughs> yep, I was, tra- <laughs> I was trying to retract my you did. You did <laughs> sentence <laughs> to what use is the flipping behavior. Um, and this is, we already kind of hinted at it. So the um, in that flagella out, that more um, kind of compact um, mm-hmm. flagella out morphology, they can swim quite fast relative to the flagella in where they can eat well. And they ran some assays to kind of, um, or, or by running some assays of both feeding and swimming, um, they could measure, quantitatively measure by comparing the two forms kind of head to head. And from here, you know, so you kind of think about these differences in lifestyle. And so they predicted that given the fact that they're swimming here, that this could lead to phototaxis. And perhaps um, if there were some patterns that would emerge through this kind of flipping and light, dark kind of um, zones that they would probably see more um, of these coanos Mm -hmm. uh, starting Mm -hmm. to, to concentrate in bright areas. And so they actually do some experiments of this they set up some chambers with either sort of spots of light or dark ones and and see that that you get con- bigger concentration so there's some phototaxis here i think we need to be a little careful so the mechanism of phototaxis and how it doesn't quite connect directly to the just the flipping in and out so like being flipped in and, and so i'd be a little careful not to like over at least for me when i was thinking about it um if you're eating well should you be in a light spot or a dark spot i don't know that that connects directly but um, certainly they observed some phototaxis, um, show some of the evidence, and then went on the same way that we were just talking with some of the um, uh, connecting to the retinol. They show that you need retinol present to see those um, concentrations. And then I think maybe even more interestingly, they had to be multicellular. So mm-hmm. there's that kind of starts to get to um, – it's kind of a cool result where it's not just sort of flipping a switch on a behavior, but it's sort of overlaid on the biology of the multicellularity directly. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Because yeah. if you dissociate the sheets, this behavior doesn't happen with single cells, right? Exactly. And so this just starts to get a little bit at some of the evolution here and perhaps the order of what, of when things happen. And they do, do a deeper dive into that um, at the end of the paper. Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to chat about why multicellularity helps to do this. Mm-hmm. That's right. And so <clears throat> so there certainly are phototaxis, single-cell phototaxis systems that are super mm-hmm. well-described. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it's not that you need to be multicellular to do that, to, to undergo phototaxis. It's, but that's what's kind of fascinating about this system. And this system is that too, right? You, exactly. And so it's kind of gone through maybe a more restricted evolutionary pathway in a sense. Um, where the biology had to get set up to do these sort of inversions to then layer in that um, behavior, which is it's not uh, necessary, but for um, different species in general, but it is for this one specifically. Yeah. So this is a cool experiment that they measure feeding and motility. So it's very cool because with the flagella in, as you might guess, they don't move. And they actually, they say they sink to the bottom of the flasks. They have some movies that show this, right? Yeah. And by the way, if you have access to this or if you want access to it, it's worth checking out the movies that kind of really 
cool. like literally literally brings it to life, right? Yeah, to see. And the then, behavior. of course, you can control this in out phase by light. So then they can say if flagella is in, what happens? And it's not modal flagella out. They move. They can swim quite quite quickly. Yeah. But I love the feeding assay. They actually give them beads, and they can count <laughs> beads right. being internalized into into the individual cells of the assembly. Right. Exactly. The micro beads that are green labeled, so you can see them under the microscope. Yep. You can see the, them, the you can count them, yeah. you can see how many cells have them in. Yeah. And you can say, do most of them have beads or do few have? That's how you can measure feeding. It's not obvious if, you know, <laughs> if you think about it. <laughs> no, exactly. If, if you're just using the bacteria that's not labeled, you could also label the bacteria would be another way to do it. But this is a simple way to do it, to fool them into eating these micro beads that are labeled to begin with. Yeah. Very so Nels, why would you... Or what's the purpose of being able to move? Because you can invert and feed. Why not just feed forever? Yeah, so, <laughs> that's right. So um, is that a, like a philosophical question or like a, a just, personal question? No, I'm just joking. I just want you yeah. to explore. Uh, no, of course. I'm just joking. Yep. <laughs> philosophical question. <laughs> No, so you know, one of the idea, the trade-off there, but or how they describe it is potentially as a trade-off. So there are times when swimming would make sense. So if you've like, let's say you've been, you're a um, collection, a colony of cells, and maybe you've got more colonies around you, and you've been filtering, feeding on bacteria in in, in the same area for a while, your prey might become scarce, and so flipping into a swimming mode. Um, could be a way then of exploring more territory to find more food. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas if you're swimming, um, and you're sort of more fall, if in, because you've got this sort of dual, uh, multi purpose role for the flagella. So that's in this, um, kind of skimmed over this, but it's certainly in Tuivo 11 is how sort of that collar that you described, um, a little ways back has this sort of like barrel morphology to it almost like an empty barrel mm -hmm. around the cell sides. And then the flagella is in the middle of that. And the way the flagella moves is to actually start concentrating or setting up currents that concentrate the bacteria toward the collar to, to then um, gain a more rich meal as you're internalizing the bacteria. And so because you have both of those activities kind of happening at once, you're moving with the flagella, but you're also using it to concentrate um, food you're, you're, the trade-off is when you're moving, you're really bad at concentrating food. And when you're concentrating food, you're really bad at moving. Mm. And so that ability to switch means that at any given time, you can be a better feeder or a better swimmer, but right. you kind of can't do both. So that would be the, the idea of a trade-off. And then the way of solving that um, potentially is through this um, inversion behavior. How that it directly links to light-dark in the phototaxis, I think, is a little less clear at this stage, at least from my reading of the paper. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not quite sure why the light dark would be the the switch at all, right? Yeah, yep. It's not clear to me, but there must be a reason. Probably, I mean, it could be kind of fun to set up some future experiments where you could just like so you because you could probably use that light dark um, trigger to to kind of take experimental control of it and just do random. Like put some in a tank, maybe you have like a food source in the corner of a tank or something like that. And then you um, have the tank exposed to different patterns of light dark or like mm -hmm. a constant pattern where it's light in one half, dark in the other. So like they sort of did, or you have flashes of light at certain things or day light cycles. And then you could start to compare just how, you know, how well the food was consumed over some amount of time. I guess, you know, some of the assumptions of that is that you're sort of recreating the natural complexity in, in the ecosystem somehow. And that's probably easier said than done. So I, yeah, I think you'd have to think through some of the assumptions, but to start to see more complex behaviors emerge from differences in light dark that could be either randomized or totally experimentally crazy versus what might be kind of more physiologically natural that, that could help to I also wonder if, up what we're really talking about is day night or micro differences in light, right? Because mm -hmm. you can imagine in a tide pool, there are places that don't get much light, right? Under pieces of rock or whatever. And Agreed. Is that enough to do this or is it really a day night thing? Yeah. Or you some know? combo. So at night, yeah. you're going to invert and feed, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe at night there's less predation. I don't know. You know, it could be lots of things, but 
I would be interesting to know if it's a if it's a day night or a micro illumination situation. Agree. Right. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. No, and there's some other really cool cases in other protozoans, like other eukaryotic microbes, where um, when you change the environmental exposures, it can really change the behavior or morphology. So, like, of course, one of my favorites from my old grad school days is Tetrahymena thermophila, and so Tetrahymena also it's a single cell, but it um, filters and feeds on bacteria. Mm -hmm. If you starve them for a few hours, so there's no bacteria, they actually undergo a pretty dramatic morphological change where they put a big swimming flagella kind of on one end of the cell and they become more streamlined and they swim super fast. Mm -hmm. And so that one idea is that, you know, there's some stress there that it also um, is involved in um, uh, some physiologic changes where they are also um, able to mate when they're starving. So you both, Swim fast and mate <laughs> if you're star if you're completely starved of bacteria in that case. So hmm. yeah, these cues of light, of food, of the environmental signals can get interpreted by microbial eukaryotes in really exciting, crazy ways. Some cells will become cannibals if you starve them. They'll start eating their mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. single cell buddies nearby. I mean, there's all kind they yeah, the morph again, the developmental biology of a single cell can be really dramatic. So a really, I think, interesting and um, the, the great example from this paper is how people are now, Nicole and others, are starting to take some of these wild, crazy things out of the wild and, and think about them um, in sort of in the lab setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so before we kind of wrap up on the um, some of the evolutionary ideas that they put forward from this sort of um, multidisciplinary study, they did... Um, they, they spend a fair amount of time describing the cell biology or the cellular basis of contractility as sort of the next phase of this. Um, and so immediately just from observing under the light microscope, the, what was happening to the cells during these um, inversion uh, flipping behavior processes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they note a difference in the color morphology. So the color again is that barreled shape structure on the side of the cell with the flagella in between. <clears throat> and in fact, there's a really nice figure kind of illustrating this. Um, this is, where is this? Oops, my computer's letting me down. This is figure F, or sorry, <laughs> figure five panel U. And um, you, they have a little diagram here of both the um, flagella in and the flagella out. And when the collar kind of closes in, then that's what gets you closer to that flagella in morphology. The whole, because there's <clears throat> cells associated in this multicellular form next to you, by kind of closing up that collar, everything gets sucked together and it inverts like that. Whereas if you open up the collar or uh, it undergoes sort of an expansion at one end of the collar, then that pushes them um, into the other orientation by just pushing off. If you, it kind of propagates um, across the cellular layer. Mm. It's not a huge difference we're talking about here. No, it's not. You know, That's right. Open versus closed. You would think, oh, but it's very, it's very subtle actually. <laughs> I agree. So as for a single cell, it's subtle. And yeah. then when you propagate that against every single cell doing that, it yeah. becomes quite, quite dramatic. Totally. Right? And totally. So, so that's yeah. a good point. They, they say that, you know, this contractile behavior, you can see it in single cells, mm -hmm. but it's only when they're a sheet does it make a big difference in the uh, the structure of the sheet. It becomes open versus closed, right? Exactly right. And so here's a really cool part of this paper, I think, and my, in some ways one of the most exciting parts, is so they also note that in this species in particular, and to kind of propagate that s subtle effect across the whole way, uh, the, so, sort of the whole sheet of cells, is they note some microvillar adhesions um, between at the, of the collars between cell to cell, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that might be sort of one of the key innovations here to gain uh, multicellular contractility. By it's not just that they're sort of associated, but because they are specifically attached, <clears throat> that. Um, helps to promote that phenotype um, where it can have such a big impact on the morphology. And so what they say is that, uh, just like you said, you can see that in single cells, but there's even, you know, some of the more described, the Rosetta species that is noted for having some contractility of the collar. 
um, doesn't have those microvillar adhesions and doesn't have this big morphological behavior. So that was, I think, a key hint as, a, as a, like sort of a key evolutionary step here. Um, I also have to say, so the um, kind of related to this is that, you know, and it gets back to your point on the single cell versus the multi-cell, <clears throat> is what is it? Why do they, as single cells, kind of do this contractile behavior of the collar part of the cell. And so there's a couple ideas and both are predator driven. And so this gets a little bit at sort of the evolution or perhaps the natural selection that has acted on some of these behaviors. And so there's, it can work in, they um, sort of propose how it could work in two directions. So one for a single cell is that if you contract the collar, it's almost like a reflex where you, the cell can with, it's almost like a turtle going into its shell um, where the cell that's sort of out sampling its environment contracts and withdraws from a potential predator that would eat the coanoflagellate. And so you could see how natural selection could act. The better a cell is able to do that contraction event, the less likely it's going to be preyed on. And therefore that would promote that behavior. Those are the, the ones that can do that are the ones that sort of will uh, have the most offspring. And from an evolutionary standpoint, will sort of take over populations. Um, the second part of that is actually the idea that they're predators themselves. And so um, some of those collar based contractions could actually help them be more effective swimmers or more effective predators. So they propose um, kind of on both sides of the equation, predator driven evolution here at the single cell level. Mm. And I kind of love this because then it's like, you have that toolkit in place or some of that biology has been selected on. And then when you put it in the context of this new behavior, the multicellular um, adaptation, then something that happened for a different reason could sort of then reveal itself as being useful in a different setting, the light dark cycle that somehow gets into the multicellular contractions. And so um, I just think it's fascinating to consider how this, it's almost like these indirect outcomes from things that could have happened in the past that could then influence your physiology or cell biology down the road. And I think that kind of gets at what's really innovative just from the kind of the evolutionary ideas of studying these systems and sort of putting and doing really careful comparisons to animals and other critters that do it single cell, multi-cell, and then sort of layering on the behaviors to that to try to um, think about what's the evolutionary pathway about how some of this stuff could, these complex behaviors could get put together. Yeah, the origins of complex behaviors in a simple precursor, which mm -hmm. maybe you wouldn't have predicted in the single cell, right? No, exactly. And so you almost, you know, you almost step through these things where, um, where the your ancestors had to the the ones that survived were either good at gaining food by being predators or were good at avoiding being eaten <laughs> as mm -hmm. prey, and sort of that kind of echoes on in new ways. Yeah. I think it's really fascinating. I, I mean, that's why I'm always drawn to the work that Nicole does, thinking about some of this stuff and develop how these like really simple things that happened in aquatic environments a billion years ago could still sort of influence our developmental biology today. Yep. Amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, so that's a little bit of a sidetrack. So we didn't mention, they did a little bit of work on the cell biology here. So, and, and this matters. So what are the details of, how, like, what are the molecular details? What are the tools? And so... Um, I wouldn't say it's like a final nail in the coffin, but some careful microscopy using some antibodies, looking at both actin and my, so like this, you know, core cytoskeletal element, and then the myosin motors that can act on it to actually cause basically proteinaceous contractions that then can change the shapes of the cells. Mm -hmm. And so they localize mm -hmm. that to some of the collar structures and use some of the the tools that they have, the antibodies from the other species of quanos to then start to put um, you know, names to faces of how you actually do the cellular biology here. And that also helps to layer in. So, and it ends up being, you know, they propose that these are myosin type two motors that are well known to be involved in actin mycin contractions. And they can, and actually they go on to do a little bit with chemical inhibitors um, where they can actually um, that are specific to the myosin type twos. And in fact, can block that bigger, um, cellular inversion <clears throat> event that we've that we've been describing in a lot of detail. And th these are mechanisms again we know exist in single cells. Mm -hmm. And here when you assemble these into a larger structure they have more obvious effects, right? 
Exactly right. And this also kind of ties into the deeper evolution. So this kind of um, actin mycin contractility in single cells is also observed in animals and mm -hmm. you know, observed in our own cells. <clears throat> right. It's observed in things like slime molds, fungi, algae. And so that kind of connects a deeper evolutionary thread for how you do some of the cell biology. And then, you know, just as we've been talking about, it's kind of fun. Then as you layer some of the, like the outcomes um, or the, the contractility sort of in the sheets, when you put it in the context of multicellularity, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but it kind of lays sort of a foundation for the toolkit that's, that's common to everything. And then you see sort of how it works out in cool new ways yeah, exactly. as you go, go down the evolutionary track. Yeah. They can yeah. also use inhibitors of uh, this myosin too mm -hmm. and show that that prevents the contraction of the ring. Right. Exactly. Right. Yep. Even in, even yep. in, and they do that both in dissociated single cells and in sheets. Right. Yeah. can show prevents contraction in the single cell and it prevents the inversion. So that's the, that myosin activity is what's doing both. <laughs> and that's right. So yep. one, it is one activity now repurposed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of saying it. And you know, you're always a little bit cautious with chemical inhibitors. You'd, again, you would love to do the genetic sort of pinpointed manipulation, which yeah, is still, yeah. I'm sure in the, in the works, but um, <clears throat> already, you know, building a pretty strong circumstantial case for this being the same God. cell biology that's at, that's at hand there. Yep. And they also note that, you know, in the transcriptome analysis, they did, that they also see these, the genes that encode the myosin two motors are mm -hmm. in this specifically there. So sort of, it's starting to piece together that picture. So the last kind of cool wrinkle here is, um, is to come, is to then ask, you know, again, to put it sort of back into that phylogenetic context or the evolutionary kind of comparative context. And so, you know, they've already compared some of this multicellular, contractility to some things that are really well studied in animals. So things like muscle contraction, right? Which is a example we're all familiar with, or some of the early developmental biology that um, we do as embryos. So the like very early, the stages of gastrulation where you kind of, these sheets of cells as they're very early in development do this kind of inversions that then set up the body plan mm. as um, animals develop. <clears throat> And so the question that they address is whether or not that, um, it, whether that is sort of from a common ancestor. And they actually claim based on the um, observations they make that you don't see this, these kind of collective, um, contractions in other coinoflagellates. And by the way, um, they note that there's as much coinoflagellate diversity, uh, in that lineage as there is diversity among animals. So from sponges to humans, imagine the same amount of genetic diversity from um, quinoflagellates that might look the same to our eyes, but have as much, you know, sort of differences as we might consider from a sponge to a human and everything in between. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of those, so certainly it's, you know, relatively sparse sampling, but a lot of those guys don't, even though they're multicellular, um, and even, even though at single cell levels, they can do contractions, as we've been talking about, they can't do it collectively. And so that builds a case for independent evolution or convergent evolution. So the idea would be after the ancestors of the quinoflagellates split from the ancestors of the animals, that animals figured out how to do this kind of stuff that's now kind of bread and butter of developmental biology, of cell biology, of muscle contraction, et cetera, that came online independently from quinoflagellates where so far they can kind of um, put this in this uh, quinoeca genus mm -hmm. of flexa and perplexa where it's been observed, mm -hmm. but missing in the others. And so what that implies, or one way of interpreting that is that this was independently sort of figured out um, specifically by those organisms. So, uh, you know, the same way that um, whales and fish have fins, they, the common ancestor didn't, but it, it worked out so that they independently came to that same solution in, in this case, in the ability to swim and that that happened in animals for all of the contract, all um, collective contractions that happen in development and just normal everyday biology independently um, emerging in quinoflagellates. So this is conclusion is because all of these coanos that they have studied, they and others have, individual apical contraction ability, right? The individual cells 
can do this. So the assumption is that the common ancestor, which in this phylogenetic tree would be shared by animals and the coanos, mm-hmm. they also had individual apical contractility, right? Mm, correct. And so the conclusion is apical constriction is conserved in the common ancestor, but not necessarily collective contraction, right? That's right. That's the next innovation. And so that's where they try to make the case that the, these microvillar adhesions that they observe that are specific to this guy that they've pulled out, um, uh, this new species, that that was the independent innovation that allowed this multicellular contraction to happen in coanodes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because the, the, this is just yeah. in the coanos. It's not in the other uh, species of coanoflagellates, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And so that's how you kind of build that evolutionary case. It's not airtight, so you're you know you you don't have a time machine. You haven't you didn't actually see this yeah, yeah. happen in real time. But that's the most most parsimonious exclamation uh, explanation, sure. not exclamation sure. yeah. <laughs> explanation, because otherwise you'd have to given the way the tree is set up, you'd have to have multiple independent losses among all of the other aquinoflagellates. And so it's just the simplest, it's sort of Occam's razor. It's the simplest way of reconstructing the history um, by making that inference. And so at, at least twice this is, a, in this uh, particular analysis, it's it's this uh, collective contractility has, has emerged twice, once for the coanos and once for the animals, right? That's right. And so for every modern animal that you sample today, you do collective contraction. So that means their common ancestor had it. That's right. That's the inference of of that. It hasn't been lost. I don't know of any animal Mm -hmm. where that's been lost from sponge to human. Yeah. And then in the coanos, um, so what's what's, uh, beyond coanos on this tree? Or is, this, or is there nothing beyond coanos? I know they're animals, but what else we have? Yeah, so you can start to add outgroups to this. And actually, it's, that's an important point that you're raising. So, <clears throat> and in one of the earlier um, trees that they show, I guess this is in figure one, mm. they actually use uh, fungi as an outgroup. Right. Um, you can also think of like algae as an outgroup. So that's a kind of an especially sort of interesting comparison that they note. So there's these great... Um, multicellular kind of colonial there's i mean striking similarities in um these algae called volvax volvox v-o-l-v-o-x yeah, right right yep and so um and that's you know that's an example of another really cool research organism where people have brought that into the lab and built tools over the years that's advancing it would be really fun to uh, we should keep our eyes open hmm. for a, a paper to consider on twivo or talk to someone working in that field um for these sort of, you know, avant-garde um, model systems or research organisms. my um, One of my science heroes, Alejandro Sanchez, hates the term model system mm-hmm. and, and is really advocating. I should do, I'll do this as my pick of the week. I think he has a short review on this to call these research organisms um, because it's um, a little more uh, sort of catching up. I think, mean, you know, last generation calling yeast, flies, worms, et cetera, model organisms made a lot of sense. But because we're kind of opening up again and looking at this, the, the idea of experimental organisms or research organisms as a term to replace that might capture some of the energy of what's happening uh, more accurately today. Um, but anyway, so the Volvox case, they just, they mentioned in the discussion here a little bit that there's a similar inversion, um, but it's much slower and it's irreversible that takes place during the development of Volvox. And so that's kind of another cool um, comparison point for the um, phenotype of collective contractility. And the idea would be that that was also sort of an independent um, innovation that happened in the ancestors of Volvox in the um, algae uh, lineage Mm -hmm. as well. But they, they aren't looking at that in detail the same way that they are for this uh, two-way comparison. Yeah, Volvox have uh, questions about parasitism were studied in Volvox, I think. Now, these are, how do these reproduce? By fission or by uh, sexual reproduction, do you know? I think both, if I'm remembering mm-hmm. correctly. Yeah, because yeah, I think some studies have looked at parasitism in both forms, and that was one of the reasons we conclude that uh, reproduction may have been arisen to avoid parasitism uh-huh, uh, because uh-huh. you get more genetic diversity, right? Exactly. That's the red part of the red queen 
hypothesis. If you've got all of these <clears throat> um, parasites, whether it's viruses, whether it's bacteria, other kind of infectious microbes or parasites that um, because they have high mutation rates, really quick replication times um, that you'd just be overwhelmed unless you were sort of countering with sexual reproduction as a way of diversifying yeah. Yeah. your um, defenses as a way of diversifying your, uh, your sort of genetics as a host on that side. Yep. That's right. Yeah. I remember reading in, mm-hmm. I think the book is called the red queen mm-hmm. by what's his name? The author. Um, Blanking on it right now. Uh, exactly. Ridley, yeah. Matt Ridley. Yep, that's right. Yep. Where he f- talked about experiments done in freshwater. You can isolate these Volvox mm-hmm. in freshwater habitats, natural freshwater habitats, and you can study the difference in parasitism for, with the sexually reproduction and and um, fission, binary fission, and you can see the difference. It's very cool. So these oh, were yeah. first discovered by Leuvenhoek. <laughs> that's right. Yep. No, they're beautiful too. There's the like global kind of spherical structures that with specialized cells, they have eye spots, they have somatic cells, they have reproductive cells. Mm. Um, you know, the reason, so, and, and, and that also helps raise a point. So the, our last common ancestor with the, um, with Volvox uh, stretches back a lot farther, something like, you know, 200 million years ago, something like that. And so, mm-hmm. you know, part of the motivation for chasing after these coenoflagellates specifically, um, and the point that Nicole makes really well is that, you're now sort of making a phylogenetic choice of the closest um, uh, sort of divergence point from the animal lineage that we know in current living organisms. Mm. The algae are super cool and have all of this other biology. It's just our um, evolutionary divergence point is much farther back in evolutionary time. And so there's been even more time to sort of innovate in different ways. And so uh, not that one's better or worse, but it's just the kind of questions you can ask or the sort of resolution that you might get with your inferences. Um, you'd make, you can make the case and Nicole thing is Nicole King has, I think quite effectively that coenos are a good choice to make just from a phylogenetic standpoint. So can you imagine 1700 Leuvenhoek is looking through his little microscope and he sees these things swimming <laughs> around. He goes, yeah, he never, no one's ever seen these before. Yeah. And you think water has just got nothing in it. And you see these. Can you imagine? I wonder what he thought or if he freaked out. <laughs> wow, it's so cool. I agree. <laughs> I mean, I have to confess, it's still fun just to take like some water out of a puddle or f- even from an aquarium filter mm-hmm. is a good place and put it under a good inverted light microscope and just spend an afternoon just <laughs> gazing at these crazy forms swimming around. Uh, that's one of the things that got me into this business or certainly kept me in this business. Is, well, I um, think a lot of kids get into it by looking at water, pond water, right? Go, let's look at this stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. It's very cool. Yeah. Mm, there you go. That's it. There you go. So I think some, you know, some of the big ideas, just to summarize, is you we have um, all these sort of thinking about common ancestry and the molecular toolbox, the overlap. So you're using actin and myosin in similar ways. So sort of those ancient connections. Um, I really enjoy sort of the ideas and there's still ideas by and large, but this idea that predator prey um, can drive natural selection sort of in interesting ways that then can get kind of repurposed Mm -hmm. as you said Mm -hmm. um, in further interesting ways as sort of biological complexity emerges. And then, um, you know, important uh, I think concept of convergent evolution, the idea that you can kind of arrive at the independently at some of the same biological solutions. um, And in this case, as proposed for, multicellular contractility showing up independently perhaps in quinoflagellates separately from animals where it really is uh, dominates a lot of our developmental biology. Very cool. Very cool yeah. stuff. Yeah. Thanks for picking out that paper. It was fun to revisit the quinos. I have to say that uh, it was pointed out to me by Will Ratcliffe. Okay. During my visit at Georgia Tech. Do you know him? I know. I, I don't know if I've met him. I certainly know his work. He knows you. Yeah, and um, he'd be a great guest on Twebo. Yeah, we'll try and get him on because he tries to take s- mm-hmm. unicellular organisms and make them evolve <laughs> to multi and then see what genes are involved. It's very cool, and he said he would come on, yeah. so we'll find, a, we'll find a date where we can get him on. It'd be fun. Yep. No, I followed some of that work really closely, and so I, would, I agree 100%. We'll uh, make it happen. Let's do a couple of emails. 
<laughs> Sounds good. We're going to jump into the mailbag here. Um, Larry writes, Doctors Eldi and Racanello. Uh, I'm a software developer fanboy who wrote in many months ago and still a big fan. I just listened to TWIM, uh, episode 190, back in December, with two papers on exosomes, a great show as usual. I was intrigued by the fact that exosomes are secreted uh, by archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes, implying that this could be universal. My first question, since there's, I would assume, a big energy cost to producing and releasing these vesicles with protein and our messenger RNA or microRNAs, or even double-stranded DNA, what's the benefit to cells for doing so? The wiki page indicates intra intercellular communication triggering other cells to do something useful to the originating cell. So, I would guess the answer, generally speaking, is parasitism and mutualism. Uh, and, uh, I'm not sure, IIUC, do you know what that abbreviation is, Vincent, offhand? No, I don't. I don't either. But anyway, so... Um, thinking about horizontal gene transfer uh, seems implied. So question number two is how um, uh, is this? If I understand correctly. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm showing my age here and not getting like the, yeah. And if I understand correctly, horizontal transfer uh, seems implied. So question number two is how is this how genes become selfish? In any case, this mix of complex yet universal behavior leads this very naive listener to question number three and a brace for the wild uninformed speculation. So what Larry points out here when exosomes are um, the original form of basic building blocks of life that are at some point embedded, have embedded themselves in lipid bags to become archaeal and bacterial cells, thus making a great leap forward in stability akin to the eukaryotic energy leap. Hmm. Um, interesting ideas uh, from Larry, who's in San Diego, where he notes, I don't know when he wrote this, but he noted it's getting near freezing at night in the inland valleys. Um, he also notes he's going back to reread some of uh, Nick Lane's ideas um, on this, and then has another PS that maybe we should have started with. He states, <laughs> on further thought, these questions seem too naive for your show. But if you could briefly discuss current thinking on pre-cellular evolution, the RNA world, and connections of any with exosomes, that'd be very interesting. Belatedly, thanks, Larry. So first of all, I have to say, Larry, great questions. I don't think they're naive at all. I think they're all perfectly good. Uh, your original questions, one through three, are all worth um, chewing on considering, thinking about some of the really early evolutionary events in um, cellular evolution. So this goes, you know, today we were talking about multicellular sort of transitions, and this takes us back another several billion years to thinking about um, the idea of when exosomes came around, um, the idea that this extends, as you note, from archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes, which implies that that's been around for a long time. Okay, so let me try to unpack this a little bit, and please, Vincent, weigh in and help um, along the way here. So I'd say the first question about the energy cost of making vesicles or exosomes and why do that. And I think it's increasingly evident that um, this form, broadly speaking, of cellular communication, the ability to pass molecules between individuals in a population is a huge innovation. Um, just the idea of, just as a concept, communicating sort of um, really can be a game changer in the evolution of um, complexity, uh, whether that's quorum sensing in bacteria, whether that's us discussing questions on a podcast and everything in between. It's expensive, but it's it, it pays off uh, massive dividends in a lot of biological settings. So I think that gets around that first part. Let me give an example in the placenta. Yeah. You know, the cells are susceptible to infection, mm -hmm. and many of these placental the outer cells, the syncytiotrophoblasts, make microRNAs. They get rid of them in ex exosome, and they go into other cells, and they protect all of them yeah. from infection. So even though you're giving something to another cell, you get protected. So that's why the cost pays off, right? Agreed. I mean, yep. that, that's just one example, but yep. many no, more, too. It's a great one. Great work from Carolyn Coyne and some other labs getting at some of that, that fascinating biology. There's also... Um, 
close by here, and I think you might have spoken to him recently. Jason Shepard has been working on this idea of um, the ARC protein that might be involved in intracellular communication between neurons in sort of exosome mm-hmm. form mm-hmm. Um, that is, uh, in certainly in knockout genetic knockout experiments, uh, it has some massive consequences on memory. So the ability to, of cells to communicate, again, like all the way from bacteria kind of hanging out in the soil to um, neurons within our brain and sort of the fundamental basis of memory somehow, right? So it's really mm-hmm. yeah. kind of yeah. a, f- a fundamental thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, so then um, getting into this idea of once you're passing around genetic material in various ways, shapes, and forms, question two is how do genes become selfish? And I think maybe, I mean, one way of unpacking that is to just think about that imperative of uh, persistence or replication. And you can define gene, I think, pretty widely here. Any kind of snippet of nucleic acid, um, which has ended up being sort of the um, building blocks of vertical inheritance or inheritance in general, genetic inheritance um, in, uh, in, in this world, <clears throat> that that idea of replicating or over-replicating is just, it's, like, it's almost um, survivor bias or ascertainment bias. It's like what the thing that replicated the most is the thing you see the most. And so in that sense, I think you can kind of extend the definition of selfishness to just things that replicate well. And then if you have, if you sort of layer that into mechanisms that work, um, then, uh, you know, obviously sexual reproduction has been a, a, a massively valuable, um, and for some of the reasons we were already talking about, but within that context, selfish neck elements or, you know, things like endogenous retroviruses, retrotransposons, as they over replicate, um, the reproductive cycles of the hosts or the host genomes, you can see then maybe a, a, a more direct example of why these things are often called selfish genes. I think that uh, you could certainly transfer genes by exosomes, but it doesn't have to be. Right, mm-hmm. C- Cells can die and just release naked nucleic acids and they can get taken up. So, Absolutely. You know, the, Larry's question is how, if, if exosomes are the trigger for HGT doesn't have to be right. Oh, agree with you. Yeah, good. No, that's a good point. And in fact, if you take the example, like the classically studied example, phage transduction, instead of exosomes, so we're thinking about bacteria exchanging genetic information. Um, uh, viruses can do that for you. They can vector. Right. Yeah. And so there, you know, that would be a virus driven mechanism as opposed to an exosome driven mechanism in that case. Right. Um, yep. Okay, uh, question three, whether exosomes are the original form of the basic building blocks of life at some point. So how do you go from, in the, you know, the RNA world, and so some of these really early events in um, the evolution of life now, before cells even existed. And this is a field we haven't covered a whole lot so far. And, and you know, I have to say in part because it's not that there isn't interesting work going on here. And in fact, for this question in particular of getting membranes or, and again, I don't know if it necessarily has to be an exosome, but just getting, as Larry says, lipid bags um, around genetic material, uh, I would point to Jack Shostak's lab. Um, They're doing some interesting work here, several other labs, and it's kind of um, a combination of chemistry um, with biology to try to think about this, but from a experimental and, you know, this is, this idea of like, if you had a time machine that could go back 4 billion years, you'd really, <laughs> you could see perhaps some interesting things happening, but the, our tools so far to really understand that, um, I think become less and less sort of incisive, which is, um, why certainly as I'm kind of scanning the scientific landscape for papers or people to talk to on Twivo, we've uh, so far we've kind of shied away from some of these really deep questions. It's really harder to get at, but I think we should revisit that. Um, and so that definitely to me feels like, you know, obviously one of the massive um, leaps of evolution was how you take, how you concentrate these um, biochemical reactions into um, a compartment. And so that's where, uh, membranes come into play, but putting that together is, uh, um, in, or in certainly how that happened originally, that is a, a area of active debate and research. I would say that's pretty hard to get your, um, hands on. So we need to get Nick Lane on at some point. 
That yeah, would be definitely. fun because he and others are um, proponents of this idea that life emerged on these alkaline vents at the bottom of the ocean, not the mm-hmm. not the smokers, the hydrothermal vents that people th- used to think, but these are dynamic vents that grow and collapse quite rapidly. But the key point is that between the water in them, which originates from under this, the surface of of the floor of the ocean and the ocean water, you generate a proton gradient Mm -hmm. and that would provide the, the energy for initial molecular transitions that you would need. And so in, in, in Lane's and others' hypothesis that, yes, membrane, some kind of membrane bag uh, may have organized the first cell and, and utilized this, this energy gradient. Whether that's a precursor to an exosome or not, probably not. It's probably too early on. Yeah, I agree. Right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if you can make that connection. But the thinking is, right, a bag, a lipid bag of some kind, right, yeah, could yeah. form and uh, take advantage of these gradients. So I think that, Makes perfect sense, Larry. Yeah, no, I do too. I also think it's start, it's really fascinating to kind of layer over kind of that RNA world idea. With once you do compartmentalize somehow biologically, then at what stage do the selfish genes? Um, getting back to question two, what stage of the selfish genes or the parasitic genetic elements? When do they arrive, and mm-hmm. how do they contribute to sort of the growing biological complexity? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I really haven't done much in that field, but that's something that, you know, I think could be um, or could, have, is, is a fascinating topic. Have you read any of uh, Nick Lane's books? Very little. We actually, he was on the hook to come to, we had a meeting um, here in Utah um, last, I guess it's more than a year, a year ago now. It mm. was um, sponsored by um, Molecular uh, uh, MBE or SMBE, Society of Molecular Biology and Evolution, or a regional meeting on... Um, Molecular evolution of the cell, and uh, we had some great cell biologists here actually who think about um, exosomes, who think about um, vesicle transport and related cell biology. And um, Nick was signed up to come; he had to bail on us at the last minute. But um, yeah, no, yeah, it's really bad. interesting. It was good, get him in your yeah. office. With uh, the that's right, book. exactly. We'll try and get him on. He's, the books yeah. are great, and uh, yeah, I think Larry's great. read them. Yep. So uh, very get very cool. get it right from his mouth. That would be cool. Yeah, good idea. Thanks, Larry, for your letter. Uh, we have an, uh, a note from Anthony who writes, Archaic admixture in the human genome gives us a link to a paper. This is a review article in Current Opinion in Genetics, talking about, uh, you know, so we talked about this on, on Tuivo previously, how much Neanderthal and Denisovan DNA we have in our genomes. That's right. Uh, so there's a review article, but then he gives us a link to a genetic atlas of human admixture history, a science paper. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Where he kind of yeah. goes through uh, um, exactly what went where based on what we know. And, yeah. Uh, migration of uh, hominins and so forth. Yeah, it's a fascinating topic and fast-moving topic. And so I'm just looking here. I think that Atlas is now coming up on about five years. And so mm, I, right. I wonder how different it is today just based on the um, advances in genome science. And, probably is, yeah. You know, human genomes in particular. So it'd be fun to revisit that um, at some point and, and watch that. Yeah, it's really fascinating to see that field progress as well. I'm still kicking myself. I had a chance to try to get Svanta Pebo on um, Tuivo when he was visiting here last winter. We went out skiing, mm-hmm. and I just couldn't mm-hmm. couldn't quite pull off the timing of it. And he <laughs> yeah, the first article the ad, ad mixture in the genome is quite old. It's two thousand and six, and they actually say we should learn more about this in the next few years <laughs> as genomes are sequenced. Well, we we mm-hmm. have learned much more, and we've talked about it a bit yeah, here on great. Tuivo. Yeah, I know. Yeah, and I really love from a um, sort of an immune system perspective, or the genetics of immune functions, um, some of those proposed ancient contributions to modern immune responses. That's definitely a theme yeah, th- right. that we keep um, picking on in, in my lab as well. So, yeah. All right. Thanks for writing in, Anthony, and keeping some interesting science on our radar. Why don't we move to our science picks? All right. So I've got one. I don't know if this came across your radar yet, but this is um, uh, novelist Cormac McCarthy's tips on how to write a great science paper. So, 
we're talking, um, you know, <laughs> <laughs> the great author, Western novelist, things like No Country for Old Men, some of these gritty, hard-driving Westerns, um, also, also has taken some interest in communicating science, actually. And so this showed up as a career column about a few weeks ago, maybe coming up on a month ago, in uh, Nature Magazine. And we've got the link here. Um, the Pulitzer Prize winner shares his advice for pleasing readers, editors, and yourself. I thought this was a nice pick of the week based on my Mountain West um, <laughs> location. And in fact, I have to confess, I sent this to a postdoc in my group who's in the final approach. We're writing a paper right now and just going back and forth on some revisions. So maybe I'll just lift up a couple of the of the main bullet points from Cormac McCarthy. Uh, use minimalism to achieve clarity. And in science writing, that's you know easier said than done, but I think that's a good goal. Decide on your paper's theme in two or three points you want every reader to remember. I think that's also good advice. Limit each paragraph to a single message. Keep sentences short, simply constructed and direct. Don't slow the reader down. Avoid footnotes, etc. Yep. Don't over elaborate. This can be a tricky one for our for scientists and our science colleagues. And then uh, a couple more. Don't worry too much about readers who want to find a way to argue with every tangential point. Sort of don't get distracted or almost write defensively. I guess would be another way of saying it. Um, with regard to grammar, spoken language and common sense are generally better guides for a first draft than rule books. And it kind of goes on and on. So there, I won't, uh, there's a, it's a pretty elaborate piece here thinking about science writing in particular. So, um, you know, I don't know if it's all words to live by, but certainly I think some good tips to think about. And some of them I agree with pretty wholeheartedly, including minimalism and clarity and some of those big ones like that, single yeah, messages, sort of distill the message. So anyway, yeah, that's yeah, that's some my of them are really good. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Science pick of the week Probably, from here. Yeah. Yep. How about you, Vincent? What's your pick of the week? <laughs> so I have a funny pick, which is a store I ran into in Reno, Nevada, a couple of weeks ago. Hmm. What were you doing down I there? I was there uh, visiting the University of uh, Nevada, Reno. I was mm -hmm. at the invite of the students. I did a talk and a podcast, and I guess the morning I met some students for breakfast at a cool place. Mm -hmm. And we were getting in the car across the street, and I see this store called Natural Selection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I And uh, the this, this store window, uh, Natural Selection, purveyors of all things odd and beautiful. Mm. Kind of little echoes of Darwin there, right? Yeah, of course. But they have, you know, fossils and plants and insects, you know, all not living, but um, preserved in various ways, and you can buy it. It's just, you know, even paintings and lithographs. Mm. Um, so I thought it was cool. I, I took a picture and sent it to Nels and said, you know, we should get them to sponsor Tuivo. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. right. This seems like a perfect uh, perfect match. But it's Stay a cool store, and if you're ever in... Uh, yeah. It was closed when I went there. Ah, but yeah. uh, you can actually shop online. They're at naturalselectionstore.com. dot com, mm -hmm. and I put the picture on. I, I immediately put the picture on Instagram, and they found it a day later. and And they have an Instagram account, and they said, uh, "Thanks for visiting." <laughs> mm. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's cool. It's such a Twivo themed store that yeah. uh, I wanted to share it. Not many of you. I'll bet there's no Twivo listener in Reno. Prove me wrong. Uh, yeah, prove us wrong here. <laughs> Let us know. Reach out if you're in the Reno area. Um, and we'll put the link. This is great. We'll put the link to the Natural Selection store. This, And if anyone from Natural Selection is listening, that one's for free. <laughs> but if you want to sign up as a sponsor, we could do some, we could really partner on extending some of the, we could have our Natural Selection pick of the week. Oh, so cool. Yeah, that would be great. And That's highlight, great. you know, a cool specimen or a scorpion yeah. or a fossil or something like that. that you're, could be a, you're not far from Reno, right? Uh, not too far. So, good question. So, to get to Vegas, it takes about a six-hour drive. Uh -huh. I'm trying to think relative to Reno um, from Salt Lake. I'm just doing a quick map Go thing. Yep. Google map here. Directions from... 
SLC. This is a seven hour uh, drive. Mm. Yep. Yeah, I, I guess west. I should have stopped by, but I, I had to get going. I was doing so much <laughs> traveling. Fair enough. But as you know, anytime you're in the neighborhood, you're very welcome to Aldi Lab Studios. I always have to get a map of the U.S. to see where everything is because I can't picture it. I can picture the Northeast. Yeah, Nevada's right next to Utah. Oh, yeah. And uh, Utah is right next to Colorado. Mm-hmm. Are you going to uh, ASV next summer? It's in, it's in Colorado Springs. Fort Collins, I mean, not Colorado Springs. Yeah, exactly. I'm definitely planning to. Um, and there's a great, um, we missed it this year, but there, uh, the lab has just started going to the Rocky Mountain Virology meeting. Yeah, I was invited to that one year. Couldn't mm-hmm. make it. Mm-hmm. Should keep that on the radar. That's in, that's in Colorado or it changes? It stays in Colorado, and in fact, it's, so Colorado State has a mountain campus called in Pingree Park. Hmm. So it's a little bit of production to get up there. You have to drive through some mountain passes, but it's absolutely gorgeous. It's kind of high elevation, um, but really, um, you know, a lot of universities around the country have these um, either kind of field stations or sort of teaching campuses that are, are oftentimes hmm. in really beautiful locations. This is a perfect example of that. And so it's a really kind of, um, you know, grassroots meeting in terms of just using the facilities there, which aren't like luxury hotels, but they're just, they're great up to date, use the dining hall and just really special places where you can both hike around in the mountains, these beautiful settings, and then also kind of meet and, um, do science. So, you know, talks and posters and the usual, Mm. um, yeah, it's a good one. Um, no, and I'm also definitely looking forward to the ASV at, in the Colorado State, right? At, in Fort Collins. That's right. Is that the, yep. Yep. That should be a good one. And, right. and those are ones that we're close enough. So actually renting, we, we've, what we'll do as a lab is rent an SUV and just drive over, road trip it through Colorado, which is always a fun drive. Cool. Yeah. About 12 hours. No, no, about eight hours. Eight hours. Eight hour yeah. drive, yeah. And then you can stop at places like Dinosaur National Monument for yeah, lunch. Cool. And, yeah, exactly, so nice. pretty great. Yeah. yeah. All right, that is Twivo 48. Happy fourth anniversary to Twivo. Yeah, thank you, Vincent. I feel like I was trying to think, like, is this a anniversary or something? like You know, like, what are the, the year anniversaries? It's the fruit and um, flowers anniversary. I don't know. That didn't seem... Super appropriate. So, <laughs> so instead, I thought I'd just consider those four years sort of like a Bachelor of Arts in podcasting. That's right. BA in podcasting or there BS maybe. B- yeah. there, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a BS in podcasting. I, didn't, I haven't taken any classes, but a lot of on-the-job training. Yeah, and work. thanks to you for your generosity through these four years, and I'm wow, looking forward to the years ahead. A pleasure to work with you. Yeah. Uh, at least another year more, right? Let's do it. <laughs> One year. <laughs> That's right. We're, you can find Twivo's uh, website at microbe.tv slash Twivo, where we have notes and links to our picks and so forth. But you'll probably listen on a podcast app on a cell phone or tablet. If you do, we'd like you to subscribe to the show. That way we can tell who's listening, not who, but how many people are listening. Helps us to get support for the show. And it's free for you and you get every episode. We just release one a month and it's not a big deal so please subscribe and if you want to support us financially if you like us enough you can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute we have ways where you can use paypal or patreon to give us as little as a buck a month not much for you help us a lot we'd appreciate it yeah please do and of course questions and comments picks on your end twivo at microbe.tv Nell Zeldes at Cellvolution.org. You can find him on Twitter as L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Thank you, Vincent. And see you in a few weeks over in Bavaria. Yeah. Giant virus meeting. We're going to have a cool twiv there with you and me and Rich Condit and three guests from the meeting. That should be fun. Can't wait. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it's not. It's just a few weeks off. You're right. Mm-hmm. Hope you have your travel booked already. Got my passport. Got my flight tickets lined up. So, <laughs> all right, I'm ready to go. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Music on Twivo. Trampled by turtles. You've been listening to this week in evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. Till then, 
be curious. 